Okay, for everybody that's watching on LinkedIn and Facebook, we are live. We are about uh, about 13 minutes before game time, and I'm just doing setups, and I'm going to ramble on as I do that. Okay, for those of you that are new to the series, let me explain what we're doing here, is that given what's happened in the pandemic, and a lot of people have realized that they're at the risk of things outside their control without getting political whatsoever in describing the current situation. As a matter of fact, let me let me see. If, can I put in, I bet I can't. No, take that back. Let me see here. What I'm looking to do is can I bring in a little of the show or is it too loud? Let's see. Let's put it on. I guess not. I was going to see if we could play a little show. Of the Into back. Agile Lean Operations, first of all. And if and, you don't know who that what is. what that really means and what that, that is. That is RJ I've, Lewis I've doing it out operations there several now. Times, what I'll do here will find is I'll it turn RJ out. off um, so that uh, she is not bringing in as much sound. Uh, so I know where we are in the show. But now let me, let me kind of just hit you with a couple things here. Is that. If you've, if you've survived the pandemic and you survived it with your business, but you're really shattered and there is it doesn't appear to be either a future or you're reluctant to build again because, after all, you see what's going on uh, in the United States. We've got mandatory vaccines uh, or vaccination that is in the mix uh, that potentially could affect your business. If you're in uh, Australia, especially if you know South Wales, you're locked down. And so... My point is, without getting into any of the rhetoric related to the pandemic or COVID-19 or government action, is that, you know, all of us are really out of control of what uh, of what's going on in our businesses because we're dealing in an environment that's incredibly unstable. So if you're looking at your business and you're saying, you know, maybe I had to do something else or you went out of business and you're going, I don't know if I really want to jump back in and you're looking for something else, or you're somebody whom has said, you know what, I'd like to do something different. I really would. And so what could that be? So I thought that I put this series together on consulting. And consulting in terms of how I've experienced it, it's something I've done for a number of years now. I've built companies and I've built consulting companies. So one is I actually have done this several times. Uh, I have failed massively. I've been successful massively. Uh, uh, I have been, in, I've run a pretty good one and I had mitzvah mitzvah. So I kind of had something that is in between. If you had four possibilities, I've had all the four possibilities. I've also consulted to companies. So I understand consulting from the standpoint of delivering the services. So I think I'm kind of uniquely positioned to do that. And instead of trying to sell a consulting franchise, which well, we've entertained that thought because it would not be a bad revenue stream. Uh, and, and again, all of you out there, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to business owners. So you, you, you're always making these decisions uh, about uh, things of that nature. In other words, what do I get in this business? What do I get in that business? And so, but we decided that this is probably the best of all the approaches that we could take would be, well, why don't we just help you build a consulting firm by doing it with radio programming? And the reality is that we're far more in the radio station. We are a media platform. We just happen to put our emphasis into uh, radio for a particular reason. And that is one, I have some expertise in the radio business. But moreover, this is an incredible medium because get away from the live broadcast and simply look at this from the standpoint of podcasting. Everybody know, out there knows that podcasting is huge. It's been huge for about four or five years. Ten years ago, people were talking about it, and the early adopters got in. Now, everybody's in it. And so we thought that we could take advantage of that. Now, what I mean by taking advantage of it is one of the beauties of a podcast or an audio recording or a live stream from radio is that you can do your job. You can work, and you don't have to pay attention because the challenge with video is it's really difficult to work and watch a video. And if you do that, like you're sitting in front of the TV set and there's like a great show on and you sit there and take notes because I do that a lot. I do that on YouTube when I look at people like Peter Thiele uh, as one example or a Grant Cardone or um, 
uh, Patrick uh, Mendavid, and you know three really good people on the internet who you can find on YouTube who are doing really good work about startups. I find myself taking notes and listening to what he was doing. So it could have just been as easily been a podcast. So when I put that together, I said, why don't we do a series on how to build your own improvement business? That was the original intention because I didn't want to leave out coaches or trainers. I didn't want to leave anybody out who is in the professional services part of our industry. But if I call it uh, (laughs) creating an improvement business, the next thing you know, you're going to expect me to show up with a tool belt because we're going to fix a house. Uh, so that's not what we're doing here. By the way, I, I don't do houses. If it was a car, uh, I haven't turned a wrench in a few years, but cars I get. Uh, houses, uh, I, I might get them, but I have no interest in doing that. So that's what this series is. So we are now on show 11. And this is um, a CIB, Create Your Own uh, Consulting Slash uh, Improvement Business. This is show 11, and today's show is going to be talking about one of the more difficult aspects, the highest risk consulting you can do, but it's also the highest reward, especially if you work out your compensation plan to where you're going to get a percentage of the increase in the business. In other words, you do the turnaround, you're going to get paid based upon the turnaround. Now, I've been paid flat, and I've been paid for the turnaround. Being paid on a flat fee uh, is usually a function of we're dealing with people for whom Either one, they don't, um, for whatever reason, don't grasp the idea of paying me out of profits. And uh, also some companies just are so fearful or owners are so fearful about their financials that they they don't want to get on the hook. So they go, look, I can afford this, do it for this. And I can use it as a testimonial. Of course, the challenge with that is you sign confidentiality agreements and non-disclosures with your clients, and typically you can't really go out and say, well, I did this company, this company, this company. Let me tell you what happened. And and the second you get into the company and its financials, you violated the terms of your agreements. So this is an interesting one to do from here because I can cite examples to you, and I will, and I have, and I will in the following weeks. But on the other hand, um, I can't really get into the detail that I'd like to simply because um, it, it's, you know, it's not going to work. It's going to create some problems for me for which I don't need to have. All right. So I've set this up. And what we're talking about, again, is how to do a turnaround in a business. So this is kind of my script. I guess I should write a book on this. I have not written a book on it as of yet. Uh, and maybe I will. But, you know, the way I look at it is. I, uh, I love what I do, and th- the issue of a turnaround is really kind of a, is an interesting, a very interesting issue for you as a consultant, because, you know, in the consulting industry, a lot of times you have, you're, you're never sure, you're just really never sure about what, you know, what you've done, what you've done in that company, have you really helped them out? I mean, they paid you and you feel good about, uh, well, hopefully you feel good about the check. But have you really made a difference? Well, here, you got a company with 70, 80, 90 souls in it. And I use that because that's a, a nautical term. You're responsible for those souls. Not only are you responsible for the 70 people, let's say, that it's in this company you're doing a turnaround, or let's make it smaller, 20, uh, 20 uh, employees. Um, you know, most of them are married. Most of them have children. And so what, you, what are you really doing? You know, 20 people is probably you're directly affecting the lives of 100 people, and you are saving them. You're saving them in this particular role. Now, maybe they can go out and get a better job. I don't know. But most people, if they thought they could do that, would have already left this company. They're staying for a number of reasons, and one of them is for security, especially if uh, the owner has said, hey, we're bringing somebody in to turn the business around. So for all of you out there that are thinking about getting into the consulting business, or if you're consultants, I recommend that you pay attention to the show and either see what you can glean from it, because I'm certainly willing to help. And in our show notes, I've got a detailed how I can provide some assistance to you. Or if you're a consultant already doing this, I'd be, I would love to hear from you, because one of the other things about being a turnaround guy is it's kind of an isolated world. There are not many that do it because it puts a huge demand on consulting skills. Um, you you basically have to be able to do what most consultants can't do. Uh, one is operate. No offense to consultants, but a lot of consultants are not interested in being operators because if they were, they'd have a different role. They'd be in a company. Uh, but but the, the other part of this is it demands 
a, the, the widest breadth of consulting expertise and knowledge possible. If you look at all the big consulting houses, like let's take McKinsey. McKinsey is strategy market positioning. Now, you, McKinsey will sell you other stuff, but I wouldn't buy it. But, in, but doing research, looking at the market, helping you reposition the firm, identifying um, target customers, and putting together a strategy to make that happen in marketing and sales, McKinsey's damn good. On the other hand, I wouldn't go to them for financials. I'd go to, let's say, Deloitte. It used to be Deloitte and Touche, but now it's just Deloitte. I'd go to Deloitte for financials. Would I go to Deloitte for marketing positions? Absolutely not. But you see, in a turnaround, you're actually going to be doing all that. Now I'm going to address it. So I'll, let me get all of you who are currently listening up to speed on where we are. So go to the website, uh, ibgr.network. That's our website. And I'll, when we open the show, I'll do my spiel, okay? And so but when you go to the website, you'll see notes on the navigation bar, a little bit right of center, quick notes. And it should be, if you're watching this live, it should be at the top of the queue. If it isn't, there's about 2,300 pages of show notes. I'll, tell, I'll show you how to find it. But you're looking for CIB.11, uh, creating your improvement business by really a consulting firm. Um, and it says that creating a consulting improvement business, turning, the, turning companies around is the uh, show. My name is William Eastman, and I am more than happy to be here. When you open that up, that's where we're going to start. So I'm going to be doing my spiel here shortly, as we do. Uh, if you've been in radio before, you know what you've got to do is you've got all of these uh, things that you need to say at the very beginning. You know, like this is you're listening to station so and so, uh, and all that good stuff. All right, so let me let me do this. I'm going to put uh, radio back on, and we're going to listen to the closing of the show and some of the advertisements. And I use that as my cue. Now, I'm going to be doing, unlike the other shows, if you listen to them, if this is my fir your first time with me, I do 30-minute segments and not 15, which is what most other people do. And that's because my shows also go out as podcasts on a number of our member platforms. And so I just, um, uh, they're all, all of them are using a 30-minute format, so so am I. Okay, so let's see here. We're pretty close. Uh, that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. All right. And so let me go and turn on some uh, noise, call our shows, and uh, I'll be with you in just a second here. <laughs> Are you looking to establish your business regionally and globally? Are you looking to establish yourself and your business as experts? Are you looking to create professional marketing materials such as podcasts, collateral for websites, brochures, and media kits? Then join us. We are Profit Radio. We are entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Every host is a business owner sharing their expertise with other owners. There is no other option at this price point that will give you the reach and professional image as IBGR. Join us by going to ibgr.network and look for the join us on the homepage. It is the best decision that you will make this year about your future. Who's that mass man? If you are a professional looking at the European startup scene, Germany is a place you cannot miss. Fortunately for you, there is startuprad.eo the authority on German startups. This English-only podcast brings you fresh interviews each week. Most likely, you have never heard or read anything on these startups before in English, but you will in the future. Be ahead of the curve and subscribe to StartupRad.eo podcast or check for the StartupRad.eo internet radio station. Check your Alexa for the StartupRad.eo skill as well. You're listening to IBGR, the International Business Growth Radio Network, better known as Profit Radio, entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. All of our hosts 
our entrepreneurs and business owners broadcasting 24 by 7 around the world to other entrepreneurs and business owners. We're also known as the number one global business talk and news station on the internet. Our call sign, our name, and our URL are all the same thing, and they are our broadcast frequency, ibgr.network. Never miss a show if you're looking to start, grow, or exit a business. We are the IBGR Network. Three, two. Welcome to the IBGR Network. That's International Business Growth Radio Network. My name is William Eastman. I am so happy you're here with the show today. And by the way, this is being live streamed. Uh, if you're listening to it live, it's being live streamed on Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, I think on Facebook, it's on our business page, IBGR Network, as well as our private group there. And that is um, Build My Business Today. Okay. Or it's on LinkedIn and it's on our business page at LinkedIn. And it's got the same handle, IBGR Network, no dot in there. All right. So what are we doing today? Number one is I want to welcome everybody who is uh, on board with us. Uh, this is a show that we, this is the only show that I'm doing uh, somewhat religiously live. Okay. And the reason I'm doing it live uh, simply has to do with the fact that this is a topic area that I'm really looking to help out uh, my fellow consultants out there in the universe, the people out who are thinking that what they want to do is they want to create a consulting business or the, um, what you're also doing is you're not just trying to create one, uh, but maybe you're trying to uh, enhance the one that you have, add other products and services. Now, if you were on earlier, I had about a 15-minute interlude in there uh, as we were coming in. One of the things I explained uh, to all, the, uh, all my listeners on LinkedIn and Facebook was that the thing to consider here is the, the issue of the pandemic has made running your business, whatever the business is, exceedingly difficult. And the reason for it, other than the obvious, let me state the not so obvious, is that you, you really don't have a whole lot of control over what's happening in the company. I mean, you think about that because what's happening to you is all external to the business. Right? In other words, these are factors that you didn't create. They're not your fault. They're coming your way. In many cases, you don't have any input into it. You know, For example, if you live in New South Wales, Australia, um, you're locked down. they got military walking the streets. Now, this is not a comment on that decision by the government of New South Wales. Not talking about that at all. The deal is if you've got a, a business that's face-to-face -face with customers, you don't have a business. And so one of the things we thought we would do at the station is we're constantly offering our expertise to other people. And one thing I've done a lot of in my career um, is build consulting firms. Most of my track record uh, as a business builder, I'm a serial entrepreneur, uh, IBGR Networks, my fifth uh, startup. The other four were straight consulting firms. And I had one that was incredibly successful, zero to 10 million in three years, which is pretty successful. What made it significant to me is not the revenue number, though it was nice, was that the margin, the gross margin on that business averaged around 43%, which is almost double. Most consulting firms are running 25 to 27% margins. And why that's significant is this. If you are running a business that's got a lot of cost involved in the production and delivery of what you have to offer, and consulting does because there's a lot of labor hours involved in it, uh, you, um, if you are not getting at least 35% margins, it's very difficult to get profitability at around 10% at the end of the year. And if you want, say, 15 to 20% profitability, you make a million, you want to keep 200,000, uh, you, you're going to have to get in the 40s in terms of your margins. Now, and that's what it costs you to make uh, or deliver the services, the products and services the customers received, not counting overhead and the other things you got to pay for that's going to pull money out of that. So that's really what I thought I could share with you was how did we do that? And I had one that blew up um, and it was outside factors it had to do with the internet, the internet bust. And I had two that were kind of in the middle. So the idea behind this whole series, and this is called creating a consulting slash improvement business. Originally, I just wanted to call it an improvement business because what I wanted to do was not exclude people in professional services outside of consulting, such as coaches, such as trainers. 
However, uh, if I put creating an improvement business, then all of you would be expecting me with a tool belt. And uh, uh, I work on cars, not houses, okay? We don't do house renovations or we don't flip houses. Uh, flip companies, not really, because typically when, and that's today's topic, when we turn a company around, it is to give it back to the owner. The owner got it into the shape it's in. It's beyond the owner's ability to get it out of that because a lot of the problems are the owner's. You know, all small businesses take on the personality characteristics of the owner. All small businesses are idiosyncratic uh, in terms of if the owner is a certain way around conflict or around money, that permeates the company. And so it's really difficult for an owner to do their own turnaround. It's a great business to be in, but let, let's get started here. So I need you to go to the website. That's ibgr.network, ibgr.network. IBGR is our call sign. It stands for the International Business Growth Radio um, and International 178 Countries Business Growth. Uh, we are basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're talking to, to entrepreneurs and business owners how to start, grow, or exit your business. And then the R in the bottom of that is obvious, is radio. This is run like a radio station. It's not run like an internet station or an internet radio station. It's a different dynamic. We run this like a terrestrial station, like if you got in your car and turned on the radio. The only difference is we're using the internet as our broadcast tower. So instead of getting a, a, a wave coming in, a frequency wave coming in, uh, what you're getting is cable, all right, for, for most of you. And so C, uh, IBGR is our call sign. Dot .network is our name. Uh, IBGR.network is also our URL. And it is our broadcast frequency. When you go to the website, you'll see the navigation bar. It'll say notes. Click notes. And when you click that, um, if you're listening to this live, what you'll get is you'll see right at the top of the queue, you'll see CIB.11. Now, on the other hand, if you're listening to this as a replay or it's a podcast later on, uh, there are about 2,300 pages of show notes in our database. So finding it is going to be a little bit more difficult. So right on the right-hand side there, you'll see right at the top, new choice for business search. Go ahead and put CIB.11 and then put creating a, a consulting improvement business in there as well. This one will pop up. All right. So now let's uh, get going. So I'm, I don't intend to read these, but when I write this, this is how I talk. So this is my thoughts on, on this topic today. Okay. Number one is performing a successful turnaround is one of the most difficult parts of the consulting business. It's high risk and it's high reward, right? It is hard. Let me explain why it's hard. Uh, because I can't cover in a decade everything that we've done, but what I'm, do, I'm going to do is give you a summary, all right? So the, the real challenge of doing a turnaround is, number one, is you have to have some operational experience. Uh, it's really difficult as a consultant, if you haven't run manufacturing, you haven't run service, you haven't run HR, to understand those type of details. Because as a consultant, you kind of understand it more theoretically. And then over time, as you get better, you pick it up. But one of the things this demands is that if you've run a business, regardless of what that business was, you're better, you're better suited to be in the turnaround business. And I would also recommend that those of you who have listened to the other 10 shows and you're just getting into the consulting business, don't go here first. I'll explain to you in a second why I wouldn't go here first because of demands it puts on you. But if you said, all right, I got a viable consulting business. It's rolling along. What's next? Ah, I'm talking about what's next. Now, if you've been in uh, consulting business for a long time, then you might be able to pick up a couple pointers here to say this may be a place to go because they're the pandemic was like a tidal wave through everybody's economy. And there are a lot of shipwrecked businesses out there that can be saved if somebody can come along and help save them because it may be beyond uh, the owner. And my guess is the vast majority, okay? And so the other thing that this demands is that you're going to be looking at all components of the business. In other words, you're going to be looking at financials. You got to. There's no way around it. You're going to be looking at operations, not only how they make the products that they sell or they make the services that they deliver, but you've got all the back office systems as well. How you do accounting, how do you do uh, marketing and sales? I mean, the IT platforms, all that falls into operations. You've got to have experience with customers. You've got to know marketing. You've got to know sales. You've got to know service. Uh, then we get into the HR dimension and you've got to know people. And so you've got a huge demand. And very few consultants have this. 
and something I said in the lead into today's show on LinkedIn and Facebook. And by the way, if you haven't got us that way, next week catch us. And I'll talk about next week's show here uh, as we close out. Uh, but the, but really the, what the issue now becomes is that the demands on your ability to do all this is heightened. And one of the things that you need to consider is putting together a support team. So I'm going to, no way can I do this topic justice. I did a whole season, 13 weeks on doing a turnaround, and that was insufficient. So down at the bottom here, you'll see a, a, a kind of a call for, you want to leave something in Facebook, you want to leave something in LinkedIn, or you want to put comments on this page and you're, you want help with this, put it in there and I, I'll be there available to you. Okay. So let me see here. So most successful consultants um, have a team available to support their efforts. Uh, as we review my process, determine which of these you can perform and which you need additional support. In my case, I sort outside help, and I always did, in finance and marketing. I understand finance as a business owner, not as a CFO, a chief financial officer. You need that type of advice because as you begin to play with the numbers, what you really need is somebody to say, hey, those decisions you're making, here's the effects that they're having. And I'll, I'll get in more detail into that where I get into kind of my insights. All right. And marketing, because I understand marketing, but really most of my time was spent in sales. And I'd rather have a marketing expert like we do here at the IBGR network. We have outsourced uh, or partnered, it's a better word, uh, with a advertising and marketing agency out of uh, Australia to help us. I don't want to go there. Because I know, uh, as a consultant, when you're coming in to do a gig, you're going to do an intervention with a customer, you're not selling things you don't know how to do, all right? Because it's true about consulting, good enough isn't. But if you're good enough in marketing, sell marketing. If you're good enough at operations, sell operations. But here, if you're not good in something, you can't do a turnaround, you're going to need a team behind you. Now, here's the four topics that we're going to cover. All right, so uh, topic number one, and da, 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 da. understand how the current situation occurred. What you're going to need is the context of the company's history and how it got here, because you're not going to, you're not, when you look at uh, the numbers, when you look at what's going on, you're not going to be able to understand all that. You know where they are, but it's very helpful to know where they've been. Is more than likely there have been some decisions that have not been thought through or people were treating symptoms and not problems. And what happened is that they thought they fixed it. They spent money and resources on it. It didn't work. And now they're in worse shape than they were in before. So number one here is understanding what happened leading up to this. Number two is you've got to go after the immediate obstacles to current performance. One of the evaluations you're going to make early on is what is the capacity of this particular firm that you're working with? In other words, if everything worked, how much revenue should they be generating? And then compare that to what they are generating. Now, I'll give you some quick uh, um, quick metrics that I use. That there, There's not a lot of science behind them other than it's just been my experience. If their capacity is below 70%, in other words, what they're actually, or the revenue number is below 70%, that means they have not exploited the capacity they have. So for example, you come in and you work with the owner and you do an evaluation that this should be a million dollar business and they're doing 700,000. Okay, so now you know if their profit margin in the past has been 10%, um, you know at 700,000, they are very unprofitable. And you look at the business and saying, okay, there's a $300,000 gap between what you're doing and what you could be doing. And so those are the things that you're going to be looking at very quickly. You're not looking to add anything new. And I, here's where I'll bring in an axiom. And I'll, when I get below the insights and I get into uh, my steps in my applications, is that a company that is in this type of shape will not be saved from sales. Just absolutely take it to the bank. Now, if you want to experiment on your own company and potentially put it out of business, do that. But with a customer's company, you can't do that. And what I mean is that you have you have bad margins, you have too much overhead, you have poor quality. Those are usually the symptom areas of something else. If you bring in more money, the amount of money that you're actually going to keep isn't going to be enough. 
And so you go after cost first. You go after why is it that we can't perform to capacity without doing anything new? Why is that? And what I want to do here is I want to look at what are those immediate obstacles. And so we're going to, we're going to review how to do that. Number three is that I want to put together a plan for both the short and long-term turnaround of the firm. In the short term, your focus is going to be on capacity and cost, quality, things of that nature. Long term, you are going to be concerned with marketing and sales and how to bring in more business. But more business right now is not going to be very helpful. All right. So, and then the last one here is know your limits, okay, and line up a team for support. You absolutely have to have some people backing you up here. And like I said, marketing and finance are the two places that I typically look because I've had HR jobs, I've had operations jobs, I've done sales. And so I feel pretty comfortable in those arenas. All right, so my insights. Now, this is the big one. And if you are an existing consultant, I know that I'm telling you what you already know. If you're thinking about getting into the business, here's a good place to start. Since all organizations are systems of, uh, uh, are a system of processes, you got a process for accounts payable. You got a system for accounts receivable. You got a system for payroll. You got a system for ordering materials. You got a system for inventory. In other words, uh, I, each one of those have their own processes to them. Understand that you're never you're never going to find a single cause. It's going to be kind of a multiple of different causes. Now they may be linked to bad decision making, for example. So you got all these symptoms and your root cause is we make bad decisions around here. Well, why do we make bad decisions around here? Well, we don't have a decision-making model that takes everything into account, so we need to improve decision-making. Aha, I have one of the things that I need to fix. But all businesses are systems. Number one. Number two is also understand that fixing one thing is probably not going to solve the problem. And in the short term, fixing one thing is going to make other things worse. And that's just the impact. So I, I really have got to think this through. You, if you're going to spend any time here and you don't have a lot of time in a turnaround because they could be, if they're weeks uh, away from going out of business, I'm not sure that you have not joined the Titanic about 20 yards before the iceberg. However, if you've got, you got a month, let's say that the projection from the business owner is that if we don't turn this around, we're gone in six months, you're in good shape in two quarters. If they say we got a quarter left, challenging but probably doable if they say we're out of business in a month well now um i i don't know what would motivate you to do that other than perhaps a jesus complex but uh that was going to get a little bit more difficult all right so the other thing you got to be careful of is you don't get a fixed or a fixation on the first shiny object that points uh, that pops up you'll go look at it go that's it yes you could be right but don't stop because that shiny object could be the reason that it's happening, number one, or number two, it could be a symptom of something else. Or number three, it's just a shiny object, and you know how to do it, and you say, okay, well, what this company needs, it needs more marketing. All right, so you want to root cause the situation to death. All right, given the constraints that you're going to have of time and resources, you want to resource it to death. All right, and I also understand the last thing I want to say about that before we go down to the, the second piece here is that whatever happens. From this point forward, if you if you stay, if you say, okay, I'm going to take the job, is your fault. Right? You own it all. No matter what happens, you own it all. You got the load, and uh, you've got you're basically uh, the person who's going to be paying the price. Okay. The second issue is the owner and their role. Uh, you need to have owner involvement in this, but you've also got to moderate that based upon the situation. If you're in a business where the, the owner is beloved and they really like the owner and it's a matter of some bad decisions, then you want the owner's involvement much more than uh, than not. On the other hand, if you're in a company where the, the people in the business basically don't respect the owner, then you almost want to do this in terms of not making them leave, but you really become the, the, the isolation. Nobody gets the owner that doesn't go through you. You keep the owner advised of what's going on, decisions. You collaborate with them, let's say, uh, because it's always going to be some sort of collaboration. But fundamentally, the owner is out of it because what I want to do is I want the owner involvement to the level that it's helpful to the project other than signing checks, okay? All right, so let's see. And remind them, if you if um, 
it gets kind of contentious, like it's my company. Yes, I'm, we're not going to doubt that. But here's the bottom line, and that is, and as nicely, nicely as you can, remind them that they got the business in this position. They're in a do or die situation. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking to you. Well, now, I didn't do that. So you hired me to fix that. So you've got to kind of go with the flow here. Or let's, um, let's you and I go have a beer and, and not work together, which would be a better move for you. Uh, you'd never want to be that hungry where you go, oh, I got to have that business. Okay. All right. So some last thoughts on that before we, we start talking about application. And that is, I'm going to give you a linear model. All right. Now, the reality of life is you're going to circle back several times on this. Because as much as you do research at the beginning, you know, this is not going to be a six-month research study by you before you take the job and start doing stuff because more than likely they don't have the time. So you're going to do as much as you possibly can do with the time and, and constraints that you have. So understand as you go along, you're going to learn things that you didn't know that you need to know and that you're going to have to go back and say, okay, let's take a look at this. All right. So now let me take this over to application. So if you're scrolling down now, if you just joined uh, the radio show or you just joined the, well, yeah, I guess you wouldn't have joined the podcast. You'd be at the beginning. Just join the radio show. You're coming on live on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, you'll find the show notes at ibgr.network, ibgr.network, our call sign, our name, our URL, and our broadcast frequency. When you get there, go to the navigation bar, and you'll see uh, notes, click notes, open it up. And uh, since I'm talking to the people who are live, Right in front of you, you'll see CIB.11, creating a consulting slash improvement business and uh, turning to company to, uh, company turnarounds is today's topic. All right. So now application number one is understand the current culture of the firm. Now, this term gets bandied about a lot. And when I listen to a lot of people talk about it, I'm not sure that they really understand it as well as they need to. Culture is hard to create. There are things that you do to create a culture, but culture is kind of an effect. I mean, uh, an effect of all the other things that you've done. And so what I want to do, on the other hand, is look at what that current culture is. And so that's why I want context. I want a story from the owner. And I probably have talked to all the key management people. The same thing. Give me, since you've been here, give me the history of the company. What decisions have been made? Uh, which ones worked, which ones didn't, which what decisions weren't made that should have been. And I kind of pull that together and say, okay, I got a reasonably good narrative. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the culture of the company. In other words, what are the acceptable norms of behavior? And I'm going to look for what are the positives and what are the negatives because I need stuff to build on. Now, one of the challenges you're going to have here is not that you have a lot of time, is you can't change everything. It's like trying to boil the ocean. I got to have to go get, take the ocean out by cups because I can put a little heat under that and raise the temperature. But if I'm going to take the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you know, 100 uh, thermonuclear bombs is not going to raise the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean by a lot. So I want to look at the positives that I can build on because that's also going to be part of my message. And number two is that I want to look at the negative saying, OK, these are things that we may not be able to change immediately. But these are things that we're going to have to change. If this company is going to survive long term, these things have to disappear. These behaviors that are either accepted as okay or are ignored uh, have to go away. Then number two is make a decision on what you want to add, remove, or continue. All right. So based upon that and your experience, what is it that you're going to build on? What is it that you're going to remove? And if you remove something, what are you going to add to it? Now, there, there, there's a whole science on culture. There is uh, archetypes. Each, each company has kind of one of four arch, archetypes. There's an achievement culture. There's an affiliation culture. There's a rules culture. And there is a power culture. Uh, none of those are good or bad. It all depends upon the business, the industry, et cetera. Uh, I'm not going to go into those here. And if you want anything on that, either in LinkedIn or Facebook, put a comment or at the bottom of the page here in comments there, put something there, and I can give you more. But I'm going to pull all that together because the big thing here, what I want to do is I want to do my first draft, my part one of what is the burning platform. Somebody is going to have to come out pretty quickly, pretty quickly as we start this initiative or in consulting terms, as we start this intervention, is that we're going to have to explain why we're going to make the change. And the, and the term burning platform comes from an oil derrick. Okay, so imagine yourself in the North Sea. 
um, off of Scotland or off of Norway, or you're off of Newfoundland, you're in the Gulf of Mexico, and the thing is on fire. As much as you don't want to jump into the North Sea, you're kind of going, I can't stay here. And that is really what your burning platform is. Now, a couple of things I'll say about that, and then I'll move on, because that's that could be a whole show onto itself, is one, I don't want to dis disrespect the past. They got to where they got to. They were doing things right. And what I don't want to do is I don't want to attack them. So part of my burning platform is you got to where you are. You did a lot of good things. Some bad things happened. And what I want to do is I want to honor what you've done and the people who have done it. Because a lot of times the bad decisions is in the audience, not only just the owner, but managers. And so do I want to attack them directly and then perhaps not get their full support? I don't. Now, I don't want to lie and I don't want to sugarcoat it. So that's why this burning platform statement needs to be um, written very intelligently. The thing that you're looking to do, and one of the culture things that you're looking probably to change because it's not present in a lot of companies, and that is you're not here to find fault. That's for later on if we do it. You're here to solve problems, and that is the new norm that I'm here to do. All right, so now, number two, you want to triage. Uh, the operation. You want to triage the entire company. And I'm going to start with finance and work my way down because then when we talk about setting, creating a new set of operating principles, I'm going to reverse the order. So one is I'm going to look at the financial performance and I'm going to look at all of the standard stuff that any one of you look at. You're going to look at the balance sheet. You're going to look at the sources and uses of cash. Uh, you're going to look at a profit and loss statement. But here is where a CFO or somebody who has that ability to really crunch the numbers to look at what are, what's underlying those. Now, my experience with this is that it's typically costs and typically quality are the places that you probably will find the first bump where you can go, okay, that's something we could tackle. And the cost could be anything. You look at the cost of the production. Let's say they make something. And you look at the cost of production and you say, well, what, what does it cost them to make it and what's their margin? And you can go to any type of uh, research uh, base uh, such as something like Dun & Bradstreet, and get that data. Okay, so let me leave it there. So you're li listening to IBGR, the International Business Growth Radio Network. My name is William Eastman. Today's show is how to do turnarounds, uh, and this is for consultants. So this is my series on how to how to create your own consultant or improvement business. Uh, this is show CIB.11, and we will be back in about two and a half minutes. Go nowhere, and uh, we'll pick up the conversation. Thanks for listening. Okay, so everybody on LinkedIn and Facebook, that's the first piece. I probably uh, I probably took about five minutes longer doing that than I had intended because I've got a lot of stuff on do this, do this, do this, do this. So man, that's just the nature of uh, radio. You get on and you get on a roll, and it's no matter if you got a script in front of you. Uh, so <laughs> it depends on whether you follow it or not. By the way, none of, none of our show hosts, Everybody here has a set of notes. That's how, when I said there's th over 2,300 pages of show notes, one of the requirements we have for anybody that's on the air is to write like maybe a one-page script, about 220 to 250 words, kind of what would fit on one side of a piece of paper. And that idea is twofold. One, it's a script for them. So, because one of the, I, I think the greatest fear of radio, if you're live is, you know, you've made a point and then you come, you're going, well, what was I going to say next? Well, this is kind of a prompt, but really, we don't write it for ourselves. We write it for you as something you go, okay, I got something I need to do. So, for example, you cut and paste these notes and then just go out and do a search and do a search on, on our platform. You know, new choice of business search. You want to you pick up a topic on, say, we're going to be talking about pay for performance. Put that in, and there's probably 15 shows that I have, it's probably all me, I have done on different ways of looking at it. And so that's the idea behind it. Okay, we've got about a minute left. Um, I'm not going to go look at the uh, comments on Facebook and LinkedIn right now because I need to focus on what's happening next. But where I'm going to take everybody is I'm just going to go work down the list and give you my two cents on these. But I tell you what, if you were to simply take this list and search on them, you would get what you need. And, of course, you can get more help from me. All right, so we've got about uh, 35 seconds left. And uh, let me see here. So triage, financial operations, marketing, sales, human. Okay. 
And what I didn't do, and I will do when I pick up and I come back, is why do you start with finances? Because when we turn, when we talk about coming up with a new set of operating principles, we're going to go in reverse order. So I'm going to address that when we come back. All right? Time for a sip of coffee. Ah, okay. Let's get this done. All right. So, Mike, if you were in the studio with me, and I'm the studio engineer, here's what I would be doing. Three. Two. And we're back. You're listening to IBGR, the International Business Growth Radio Network. My name is William Eastman. I am the host for today's show. Now, what are we doing today? Well, this is this is part two. And so if you're listening to this as a podcast and you got to this one, you're going to have to get the first one. All right, because I'm not going to cover all the ground that we covered before, but we got a lot to do. So you need to go to the website. No matter how you're listening to the show, go to IBGR.network, our call sign, our name, our URL, and our broadcast frequency. And when you get there, you'll see notes, quick notes. And when you get to the notes page, uh, this may not be at the top. It's CIB.11. If it isn't, then you'll see right next to that new choice for business search. Type in CIB11, and that is creating a consulting slash improvement business. All right, turning companies around. Put that in, and off you roll. All right, so now. What we covered uh, in the previous segment, as I did a summary on, this is probably the most difficult part of consulting, that if you're going to create a consulting company, you do not want to go into the turnaround business initially. What you want to do is you want to get some practice at consulting in the areas of your expertise. Now, if you've run a business before, you're in better shape than somebody who hasn't, who is strictly a pure consultant. Don't put down on pure consultants. It's just a matter of knowing what you're good at and sticking to it. And so how do you pull all those skills together? Well, the other thing we talked about is that most consultants are well-versed in a couple areas of business, but very few of us are experts at finance, operations, marketing, sales, service, people, uh, roles of uh, business owners and CEOs, and all of that information that is going to be combined in an effort like this. And so looking to get a team is a great place to go. Um, I always would go to a financial expert when doing this simply because I, I'm good enough to read the balance sheet, uh, income uh, income statement, profit loss, or sources, uses, cash, like any other business owner. If information and, deci- and help in decision-making you need is probably, if you're not a financial person, probably beyond you. So get a team behind you. So whether you introduce them to the customer or the client, rather, or not is up to you. You can basically use them to give you advice, and and you look like the guru. You look like, uh, what's that TV program? The Profit? Okay. Um, by the way, it's not my favorite program. I'd rather watch Bar Rescue. I think I think uh, uh, Tepler is a much better uh, turnaround consultant uh, than The Profit, but that's his personal opinion. All right, so we're covering four topics. Understand the customer. how uh, What happened with the customer or the client to create the current situation? Number two. Uh, you got to fix the media stuff first. Basically, you got to triage it. Number three, you got to put together a plan for short and long term. And number four is you can, you've got to know, as I said, what your limits are, what support you need. Now, scroll down. And in the application, what we covered in the previous one is you got to understand the company culture, which is part of that getting that story. Because long term, if this is going to work, the culture has to change. And culture can't change by doing a thing. It's a combination of things over time that take hold. Number two, triage the operations where we left off. And here I've got finance first. Now, the way I want you to look at this model, the way I understand it and the way I use it, is financial performance of the company is an effect. It's the outcome. If you turn this into a math formula, it would be operations plus marketing sales plus people equals financial performance. However, I need to start here because this is where I can get some good indicators of where do I look. Number two is I want to look at operational performance. I want to look at how the company is doing business. I said right before the break is I'd heartily recommend if you're a consultant, get get a uh, subscription to Hoover's uh, slash Dun & Bradstreet because what you'll get in here is information about other companies' this industry, and you can find out, for example, what is typically – uh, the pricing on this product or service? What is typically the margins made on this? What are typically the cost? And you can begin to do a little for, uh, forensic accounting, uh, if I can call it that, on what's happening in the company. But with operations, I want to look at what do they have the capacity to do 
and what are they currently doing? And then what are the obstacles between those two points? And it's typically some combination of, if it's production, of ordering inventory, not using it correctly, not having processes on the floor, how much having too much waiting time uh, between uh, stages of production, what we call WIPI or work in progress inventory. Uh, it's quality because quality costs you money every time you got to redo something, make it over, scrap it. So I'm going to look at all of those areas, all right? And of course, part of this is I got the financial numbers. I'm going to be talking to people that have been doing it plus your own experience. Then I'm going to be looking at marketing and sales. Now, we are not going to go after marketing and sales initially, but I want to get a handle on that as well. And what I should have put on the notes, and I will I'll make this modification uh, when the show's over, it's marketing, sales, and service. Because right now, if we're going to do any selling, and for everybody who just joined us and wasn't here for the first uh, half of this first podcast, let me say this. If you want to guarantee failure in this initiative or this intervention is go after sales first. In other words, the company's not making enough money. It's upside down in profitability. Uh, it's not at break even. The temptation is, well, we got to sell more. Well, you're selling more into a bad system. You can't sell enough to make up the difference. And so if you want to fix the company, get your cost down, get your capacity up, and now go out and sell. And that's going to be good money coming in as opposed to bad money. But on the other hand, service is a place that I can take a look because where would my initial new customers come from? They would come from existing customers. And so maybe what I can do is look there to gain some more revenue. But it's going to be service only in terms of uh, upselling. And by the way, if that sounds confusing to you, uh, my rule on service, and I've worked in service for a good many years, is service is not a random act of kindness. Service is upselling. Service is part of sales. You're selling to an existing base, and if you can sell the existing base, uh, you reduce your cost of acquisition or s of that sale. I want to say cost of sales because that financial number takes up other things, but the cost of that sale is about 80% less than if you've got to get a new account. I also want to take a look at what's going on with people. And I want to look at accidents. I want to look at days off. Uh, I want to take a look at um, acts of sabotage, um, how hard people are working. I want to look at all those other factors because those are all indicators of something's going on. I've triaged the operation, all right? So now, using tools that we've talked about in the, in the past, root cause analysis. So if you want to get at this, just look at anything that we've done on either root cause analysis or we've done on problem solving decision making, put that into the new choice for business, uh, uh, new choice for business search. And there's plenty there. I can't do it here. Based upon that, now I'm ready to put together a new set of operating principles. Now, this is my first attempt at not only fixing the immediate problem, but going after the long term. And the long, the long, long term is to change a culture. So I'm going to start off with management by objectives. I'm going to be taking a look at, in the short term, what do we have to fix? And I'm going to institute management by objectives, which is nothing more than a structured process of what we call GOMB, Goals, Objectives, Metrics. Goals, what results do you need to get right now? Objectives, what activities you need to engage in to make the goals happen? And then what metrics do we need to measure progress and or measure results? And then I'm going to go and I'm going to start in operations. And that's where I'm going to be looking. Then I'm going to be looking at marketing and sales. I'm going to be looking at people. And then if I made those changes, and this is where having, again, a good financial person there is that they have built you a spreadsheet, okay, of the current situation. And what you now are going to do is if we change, for example, we go in and we make these improvements in operations, what does it do to the financial picture of the company? And you'll know right then, if your root cause analysis is right, you've identified the right issues, you'll know right then what positive impact you can make on the company. You'll also know that if you do that and it doesn't change the financials, you're going to have to go look again. But I, I believe that management by objectives is the best way of going because it's going to formalize what probably has not been formal, and that is how does the company uh, plan, how does the company schedule, how does the company allocate work, How's the company uh, look at cost, quality, et cetera? This is a way of getting it. And by doing it this way, I'm having a, a positive impact on the culture of the business. All right, now, 
I've done all this. What is the time to do? Because I haven't, I haven't gone out, as we would say, back in my uh, nautical days, we haven't gone on, uh, out on deck yet and announced this. So now what I want to do is I want to co complete my burning platform statement. I want to finish this, okay? And three things I want to say. Here is why the past no longer works without putting anybody under threat or under the gun. I, I don't, I'm not going to single anybody out. This is not fault finding. Now, here's an aside on that. If I get some resistance from people in the organization, especially people who are in supervisory and management positions, I can guarantee to you I know what they have done in the past that has contributed to the company's failure. And so this is a conversation I'm going to have when they go, well, I don't believe this is going to work, and, da, 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 da. and you'll get that, especially your consultant. You know, I mean, everybody, you know, they'll say to you what they can't say to the owner. So they'll dump on you, and then your response is, nicely is, nicely as you can't go. And, well, let's go back. You made this decision, and it failed. You made this decision, and it failed. You made this decision, and it failed. So you've contributed to the failure of this company. Are you professional enough to admit that, and are you ready to make the changes required? I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go out there and tell everybody it's all your fault. But you know it's your fault. I know it's your fault. The owner knows it's your fault. Now, let's start. Let's start with a uh, clean slate. Let's go fix the problems. That works in the majority of circumstances. The other thing that could happen is they could say, "I'm out of here," which, if that's the case. Wonderful. It's better to have that job unfilled and be looking for somebody to come in with fresh eyes and talent because now you probably will hire somebody with a little different mix. But I, you know, I, w there's no time for this. So fault finding is usually a dead end street. Uh, number two is you want to talk about the new plan, the short term and long term, and explain to them why, which is part of the burning platform, but also what's going to happen in steps. Here is what we're going to do. And then number three is that you're going to say, okay, so here's the new principles that we're going to operate. Now, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, I was in a manufacturing company, and one of the things I noticed was that there were no, there was no what I would call management discipline. Nobody was going on the floor for management in a manufacturing facility on any frequent basis to find out what was going on. They were just looking at numbers that were coming up to them, and some of those numbers were hours old, some of them were days old, and sometimes weeks old. You can't run a manufacturing facility without having the managers of that connected. Now, I'm not talking about running it, unless, of course, they have to. I'm talking about being connected to what's going on. And so we instituted tours, visits, and huddles just to bring in that management principle. Uh, and a tour is you, you tour the plant a couple times a day. Everybody knows you're coming around. You're going to be looking at cleanliness. You know, you have your list of things that you're going to look at, and you're going to talk to people about those. Visits are when you begin to see that a, a particular group is doing bad or, or good, you're going to stop by and have a conversation. Those are totally unpredictable, uh, all right? And there is no way that they are going to understand uh, or predict when you're going to show up. And then the huddle is, and we instituted. When you came on shift, you went off shift, there was a huddle, and we used the term huddle because nobody sat down. It was a stand-up meeting, and we had some questions everybody answered. And by the way, if you want that, do the new choice of business search. It's in there. All right, now, short term, let's get into what you're fixing. I'm going after cash, and I'm going after cost. And what I mean by cash is I've got to improve the working capital of the company. I have to improve how much cash is on hand. I'm going to be looking at accounts receivable, accounts payable. I'm going to be looking at if there's inventory, how they order, how they take that down. I'm going to be looking at preventive maintenance, if there's equipment. But basically, I'm going to be looking at what does it cost to run this place, and I'm going to challenge everybody to a 10% reduction. Now, without getting into the details of that, one of the things that we instituted, and this was a a new practice, a management practice, or you could say a new operating principle, is every job showed up with a budget. In other words, here was the estimate of things like, one, materials. If there's any materials involved, here's what the materials are, here's what they cost us. Labor, the individual doing the work, or supervisor labor, labor of the, all the hours in there. Here's who's working, here's how much time we allocated, here's the cost of doing that. And then the third thing I would have on here, here's the margin that we're looking to get on this particular piece of work. Now, if I pass that down, number I've done two things. Number one, I've educated everybody on how the business operates, 
which they probably don't understand. Number two is I've given them targets because now what I'm going to say to everybody is I want a 10% reduction in cost. Your job is to go get it. Now, if this is the first time this has been done, this is a lay down. This is not going to be difficult to do. So cash and cost. Number two is I'm going to look at quality and capacity. Why aren't we performing up to the level that we have the ability to do? We have a machine that's running at 70%. Why is it running at 70%? What's the cause behind that? Because if it's not running at least, and again, this is my experience with manufacturing, but I think it carries over to service as well, is that if you have a piece of equipment that is not being used at an 80% rate, you got to ask yourself some pretty serious questions because the thing is probably not returning the investment on it. And so I'm also going to be looking at quality. How many times we're redoing stuff, we're remaking it, how many times it's out of spec, how many times is the customer kicking it back and we've got to do it all over again. As I said before, I'm going to be looking at marketing and sales. Uh, In this perspective here, marketing and sales is going to be more about current customers that we have and what service is going on and let's fix that and let's start selling to them. And then the last one is I'm going to be looking at people uh, for example, do we have to have to, and I hate to say this, but it could be that a lot of people are underpaid and I'm losing them. My retention's terrible because I'm paying people two bucks an hour under what the competition is offering and I can't hold anybody. So you might actually have to increase your cost of operation by raising some salaries up. On the other hand, how do we put in a pay for, uh, for performance system? where we can go to variable. And this is, a, we've had a great deal of success with this. And that simply means that nobody in the company has 100% of their money guaranteed, just like a salesperson. And we treat every job like sales. Uh, if you want more on that, put in pay for performance. And the four, and, the, and the four is the number four, not F-O-R. Pay for performance. Put it in the new search for, uh, the new choice of business search. And I've written extensively about that. All right, now. If you've got this done, now you are ready to rock. Now, the long term, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay away from marketing and sales for right now. Here's the long-term conversation I want to have. I'm going to talk, look, I'm going to look at the scalability. All right. How is this company easy to scale? What do we have to do? So if we fix this and we start selling, then what? What can we possibly do? Can we, if we could sell 25% more, can we do 25% more? Let's say our capacity is at at a million um, right now. What would it take, and that gets me down to the next one, to take that to a million and a half? So I'm going to be looking at the scalability of the current operation because I may have to fix the processes of how we do business. Let me take it over to the service side. I want to take a look at, let's say I run an HVAC company, you know, heating, ventilation, air, and air conditioning. And a big part of my money is coming in uh, uh, renewal contracts for people. They buy a particular type of uh, air conditioning heating unit, uh, heat pump, etc., And then we make our money on the annuity from the service contracts. We got to go out there. Okay. What's the scalability of that if we increase the number of customers we have? Is it simply a matter of adding more trucks and more service people, or is there another solution to that? I also now want to talk about capital investments, because what are we going to do with the increased money coming in the door? All right? That is a big one with me. And I want to be able to, when I'm talking to them, and say, okay, when we do the turnaround and we get to here financially, here's the reinvestments we're going to make in the company in order to not only make the improvements that you have got, you know that you have worked hard to create but to make them long term and build on them and then i'm going to be taking a look at what are the external drivers going on in the market and the external drivers are what's happening to our current customer base what's happening to our industry so i need to kind of predict now long term prediction i don't think is possible i don't think that you can take a look at um, the future and say, well, this is where we're going to be in five years. I mean, it's a great exercise to do. And if you're doing a business plan, you should do that. But the reality is the near future is about all you can predict, which is six months to 18 months beyond that. I wouldn't go any further. Uh, so you do, uh, you do a plan for right now. You do a plan for five years. So you got kind of those two together and you say, okay, now in 18 months, what do we think is going to happen? Where do we need to be? I wouldn't go any further than that. And I probably, I'll change the notes here on long-term. I'll add, I'll add marketing and sales to that because now 
that becomes number four on my list is marketing and sales. Now, given that, now I'm, I know what investments I'm going to make, and it could be that we're going to hire a marketing firm to come in and take that over if we don't have one. Or it could be that I'm going to go out and I'm going to get a sales manager because our sales force, it just really isn't getting it done for me. So I'm going to make those long-term decisions. Okay, and then finally, the future. And what I want to paint for them, and by the way, this is something that I'm explaining in my burning platform presentation. This is something that is in the plan. This is something that I'm executing on. So it's three things. I'm telling them what's going to happen, okay? Then I'm showing them how we're going to do it, and then we're doing it. I want to talk about, as the company grows, where does the future lie for this business as we see it today? Because I want to create a compelling picture. Most people resist change. That's just a given. I, I mean, you could get annoyed about it or upset. The reality of it is, on the other hand, is that it's just what it is. So deal with it. Just like getting upset at the pandemic. Yeah, I've been upset about it because a lot of the people that I work with, a lot of our clients, a lot of our listeners, uh, some of our hosts have been devastated by it. Well, you know what? Get over the emotion because there's not a damn thing you and I can do about it. What we can do about it is our response. What can we do to, one, either get through this, or two, how do we take advantage of this unpredictable disruption to do something different that's better, and maybe the long-term health of the company is in that direction? And so I want to talk about if we reinvent the firm, what do I believe is the case there? And I want to create as a positive vision to pull people through it. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about is your role. You're not there. You're not there for the duration. You're not there for the whole period of time. It could be the ship gets righted, okay? You're, you're now, given your current capacity, you are now profitable. And let me go back to that. What I want to do in my, in my turnaround in this intervention is given what I got, I want to get us to profitability before I do anything else, before I market anything more, I sell anything more, I come up with a new product, I come up with a new service, I go through massive, I, I bring in, not massive hiring, but I go into hiring. In other words, before I do anything, I want to fix what is immediately wrong with the business, and I want to get it profitable. The last place I was at, they were losing money at 600000 a year. Well, the goal, first goal was to be um, profitable at six hundred thousand. So we're not going to we're not going to change the top line. We're not changing the revenue in the first pass. We're reducing the cost, and we knew how much we had to take about uh, about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars out. And once we did that, and that was a combination of better inventory management, better quality on the floor, tighter processes. Um, really looking hard at our installation teams because we, after the product was built, it was built on spec, uh, it was built, on, excuse me, by order. So we didn't build anything that somebody didn't want. But then we had a, a huge process with a problem with our installation teams. And so we had to fix all those pieces of it. But once we did, we took, we, we, we basically got the company profitable because we took out all of that cost. And $200,000 sounds like a lot of money, but let me turn that into, into 240000 for a second. There's 12 months, right? So 240000 over 12 months is what? 2000 a month? Would that be right? Yeah, no, yeah, 2000 a month would be right. That's all we had to find. And then when you've got, 80 employees, and you've got all we had at any one time a half a million dollars in inventory. Trust me, it isn't that hard to find, especially when you challenge everybody for a 10% reduction. Okay, so and part and part of our problem was now I'm thinking about them. I don't want to go too far down that rat hole. Is their accounts receivable process was terrible because they also weren't getting paid on time, and if they got paid on time, it would took care of about 25% of the problem. All right, so. That is my formula for doing it. So think of it this way. Do your homework. Get the context of the situation. Number two is come in with what you believe are your best practices, the ones that you have developed over time. That's why I said as a consultant, it's probably difficult to start a turnaround business because one of the things you're going to have to do is when they say, well, where have you done it before? <laughs> you don't want to go, no, you're first. 
Um, now I, I, I'll tell you if they're going to die in a week, <laughs> they'll probably hire you, but, uh, you know, you don't want this to be the first one you did when somebody says, well, have you done one? You said, yeah, I did one. And what happened? Well, they went out of business two weeks later. Not a, not a great recommendation, but just get your act together, build a burning platform, build a compelling picture for what the future is going to look like. Don't do any fault finding. It's all problem solving. And then go after cost and say to yourself, if they're at a million dollars and they're, they're underwater by a hundred thousand, our first goal is to find a hundred thousand. Let's be profitable or at least break even at a million and start there. And once you do that, and I can tell you, if you get, if you map your processes, you design standard operating procedures, you get good metrics in place, you get your scheduling right in terms of how work goes through the facility, and that's products or services. You everything has a budget attached to it, so everybody knows basically what it costs. And then to pay for performance is really simple. If somebody saves you a buck uh, out of the cost, give them a dime. In other words, if you save me a dollar in cost and I get to keep 90 cents of it, I'll make that trade every single day. And just do, if you just do that, you just get them healthy there, you have done in their mind a miracle. A miracle, I can think is what we had a former American president say. And that'll get you there. And then if you want to hang up with them to take them into the future and now get the sales up, uh, please do that. But fundamentally is never, never, never go after sales or revenue first, you're not going to fix it. What you got to do is you got to get them profitable at their current, you got to get them profitable in their current processes with their current people. All right, that's it. Uh, I think at the bottom of the page there, I got a couple of things. Uh, we have LinkedIn and Facebook, as we've talked about a lot. Uh, you go there, IBGR Network, IBGR Network on either one. It'll take you to our business page. Participate there. We put a lot of information out. And if you want access to everything that we do and have, then my recommendation is join the private groups over at LinkedIn. It's called the IBGR Growth Community. And over at uh, Facebook, it's Build My Business Today. Either one of those, and you'll get access to a lot of tools we talk about. The last thing I'm going to close with is we have an app. So if you want access to everything that we do, live shows, podcasts, show notes, our community, which I haven't talked about, and which I will be talking about shortly, uh, not today, but as it's ready to go. And everything we do is, is a, uh, as a media company, maybe the best way of saying it, is available on an app. You can either go to ibgr.app. And by the way, that uh, hot link there, which you can see it's in blue, will take you there. But Apple or uh, Droid has it, and it's real simple. Either IBGR or Business Growth Radio. Either one of those will get you the right place. Thanks for listening. And next week, we're going to wrap this whole thing up. So with that, this is William Eastman. And uh, to show, oh, I got to go. Bye. Okay, I'm not going to stay on here much longer because I think I got a conference call coming up. And so anyway, here's the bottom line. Yeah, I do. Here's the bottom line. If you want to start a consulting firm or you're running one and you want to get in partnership with us, it's really simple. Facebook, LinkedIn, either one of those, put in uh, something how I can get a hold of you or put it in a comment and within 24 hours, probably half a business day, you'll be hearing from me. All right, with that. Have a great day. Thanks for listening whether or watching, whether it was right now or it's later on. And so this is William Eastman, host for today's show. I'm out of here. Have a good day.